And now a little bit on our meeting. Well, you know, it's already it's about Cuba predominantly. Uh, the first part is a video made by uh, uh, Professor Jorge Santana. He's a, a retired professor from Sac State, or maybe you're not retired. Huh? Are you are you retired? Yeah, okay. okay. And um, he's a Sacramento resident. The second part is a talk by our main speaker, uh, Paul Bardwell. Uh, he's a Sacramento resident too, but he's joining us from Sweden, where it's about midnight. So please understand, he's uh, giving up a night of his vacation to talk to us here. So we appreciate it very much. Uh, after his talk, and then we'll follow up with question and answer. Uh, we'll have a section on club business. We'll talk about upcoming events. And one of the upcoming events might be a trip to Cuba. I don't know. So uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead. Professor Santana, uh, go ahead, take it. So let me, let me just say a couple of quick things about Professor Santana, who um, in 1998 was the first person who came to me with the idea of going to Cuba. And he, I was living in Cornavaca, Mexico at the time. And he asked me, what would it take or how can we go there because he had been personally and Jorge's dual national Mexicano and also American and had been leading uh, not only trips, but uh, master's degrees uh, at Sac State to different countries, uh, Spanish speaking countries. So in the Spanish department. And so we had already done trips to uh, Mexico and Guatemala and Puerto Vallarta and other places uh, as well as uh, Peru uh, and Spain. So uh, Jorge was kind of the first person who came to me and uh, pulled him out of retirement. I can't remember how many years he'd been in retirement. <laughs> he came out again in April and led a tour in April. And so I'm going to kind of let Jorge take over from here. But while we were on that tour, he made this video that he's going to show you guys too. And he's just, just a creative, great mentor, uh, artist, uh, painter, uh, you know, cartoon uh, maker. <laughs> now he's involved in, in Woodland with Cuba art. So maybe you guys, he can type a little information in the chat about that. If, if those of you are interested in going or I can get some emails yeah. later on and send information out too. Yeah, and we'll have it on the website too. Cool. All right, Jorge. Yeah, well, thank you very much for inviting me to this Zoom conference. And uh, I hope uh, to also help uh, uh, create some interest on Cuba. It's a country that uh, desperately needs uh, tourism because of course COVID has uh, been very, uh, it has affected Cuba quite a bit. And uh, I sensed on my last visit in April that the people are somewhat desperate because of the food shortages. And so that's one of the things that I think uh, eventually has to be uh, improved. But uh, I try to capture some ideas of Cuba in my YouTube video. And uh, if you have any questions after you view it, I'll be more than glad to answer. And I'm sure Paul can also provide information. So it's a country that really needs our help. Uh, and uh, sounds like your group is uh, a world traveler group. So on with the film and uh, I'll be glad. Whoa, whoa, just hold on a minute. Something went funny here. Okay, now let's do share. Video, well, plans well, here. there we go, there we go.
Three for twelve, and the other. And that's dollars. Who's right? that? One for four, three for ten. Un poco más, 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 un poco más
of security of government as military area. Great. I hope you enjoyed the video and just want to point out it, it was not only a lot of food and drink and fun and music, but we also encouraged our travelers to pack uh, suitcases of stuff that can help the Cuban people. Uh, we did go to a beauty salon school that uh, was very grateful for all the articles that were given to them to this uh, salon or beauty school. So, you know, we try to do our small part to try to alleviate at least for some of the people, uh, some of the hardships that uh, the Cuban people are, are enduring. So uh, hopefully in, if you ever travel to Cuba, they would accept anything from stationary pencils and clothing and medicines. So by all means, if, uh, do help all you can. And I'm open for any questions, or if you have no questions, then we'll continue with Paul or whomever wants to speak. Okay. I think, Jorge, we're going to go through a little bit and at the end questions just so uh, sure. uh, kind of keep it a little bit tight. Sure. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, a little bit of the history of Cuba because uh, as the political parties gain power, uh, it changes. So in general, the Democrats open up Cuba and in general, the Republicans shut it down. And so I'll start and go briefly with Clinton uh, from 1993 to 2001 as a modern day president. You know, he kind of started the whole people to people travel, which has been a huge conflict over the years, the last 20 years of yes, no, yes, no. So Clinton started it and it was basically to try to get Americans to travel to Cuba legally, uh, this exception called people to people where you could talk to Cubans, meet with Cubans, help Cubans, support Cubans. That was the idea. It's never been open just for tourism. So you have to fit within these categories. The main categories are religion, uh, support to Cuban people, people to people, it could be journalistic activities. There's a lot of other ones that don't really affect us because they're not gonna affect you unless you're you know, in, in government, but those are, those are the main ones that people travel under. Um, and then from 2001 to 2008, um, you know, baby Bush basically shut down Cuba more than any other president did, uh, even for universities, which is another exception to travel to Cuba. He made it that the minimum stay in Cuba was 10 weeks. And I was bringing a lot of universities at that time. And the only school, 98% of the universities quit going UC Davis did go. I actually took UC Davis uh, in that period of time, and uh, there was only 11 students that went, but they went for 10 weeks. So 
being in Cuba for 10 weeks is not an easy task. So just limited supplies of everything. Um, and that really cut out the university travel. However, what Bush did is he opened it up religious purposes. So his whole thought was let's build churches in Cuba and change Cuba that way. And then the Cubans reacted by, no, you have to have a religious purpose uh, permission to come in and do this. So there's always this tit for tat thing going on. Um, we actually, I ended up for a while, for about a two or three year period, Sonoma State was one of these schools where I knew the professor really was. I said, okay, we're gonna, it's gonna look religious, but it's really a university program. And so I kind of gave everybody what they wanted. Um, and we were able to travel to Cuba for a week uh, with universities and, um, you know, the government, our government didn't really know. And, and when we got to Cuba, we weren't meddling with their religious activities. We were just working with NGOs. So at the heart, it's it's kind of what what they wanted to do. Then um, from 2009 to 2017 was probably the wealthiest period of time of travel to Cuba under Obama. Um, he expanded people to people to make it for individuals. So you didn't have to be in a group. You could individually go to Cuba, uh, get an affidavit in Miami or Fort Lauderdale sign that affidavit saying that you were going to meet Cuban people to talk with them and you had to kind of document a little bit what you were doing but that was the most open it ever was and during that time that's when Cuba started opening up more too they were allowing more businesses so Raul took over probably around 2011 Raul Castro from Fidel and he opened up over 200 activities where Cubans could actually have their own little businesses and do things. So anything from a hairstylist to painting nails to having a restaurant to having a bed and breakfast, um, all these activities were open. And and they, he was more liberal than uh, his big brother Fidel. And then he also then allowed people to sell cars because you know everyone's like, ah, oh, the Cubans they just love American cars. And the fact of the matter is, it was the only car you could own. <laughs> okay, so. If you owned a car before 1960 and it was your car, you got to keep it. And on the license place, it says particular, which means it's personally owned. And you could give that to your son or daughter or nephew, but you couldn't sell it. And then that law later changed under Raul Castro, where you could sell your car and you could get a passport. As long as you had a hundred bucks and enough money to leave the country, you could do that. But not everyone had that access to that kind of money. Um, and then it, it became the same with selling houses, so that you could sell your house. So under Raul, in a short amount of time from probably 2012 to 2018, there was a lot of progressive things uh, that changed uh, with him. And when we do these tours, and I'm looking at doing one in early December and uh, also in April, we, we focus on different things. And so for example, the this tour that you just saw, um, and it's kind of the leader's uh, direction it was more general. It was in Havana. You know, we focused on nonprofits. We focused on art, music, and dance. And then the trip that we took in June was a little bit more focused on just art. And we also went to Cien Cuegos to visit artists there. So every trip is a little different, has a little flavor. And sometimes the weather also affects what we're doing. So under Obama, who actually visited Cuba, uh, the first president in over, I think, 60 years to actually go to Cuba. Um, things were opened up more. The Cuban government was a little bit more open. And then, uh, you know, when Trump came in, I want to say that was 2017, somewhere-ish in there, um, everything started flipping back again. You can kind of see this movement of Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. And um, under Obama, you could bring unlimited cigars back for your own personal consumption. Uh, there were cruises even starting. So first thing Trump did was cancel the cruises. Uh, then he canceled the people to people travel. Uh, then he actually even uh, stated and put it in the, uh, the, the sheets that uh, Cuba was a terrorist nation, that they supported terrorism. And so that affects all the university travel because that puts you in a different category. So you're either one, two, three, or four, and that moves you automatically into two, which pretty much unless you're a liberal you know, West Coast University, most of the travel for universities got wiped out with, uh, with Trump. And then uh, he also basically said, no, no Cuban cigars could come into the United States. He also limited the amount of money that uh, Cubans could send to their family and remittances. 
And Obama had opened that pretty much wide open to where uh, you could send as much money as you wanted to. Um, just recently, um, our current president has changed some of that policy where uh, you can now send more money to Cuba. But he hasn't really done, Biden hasn't really done anything other than that. He's made mention that there could be Americans going to Cuba to help teach Cubans how to do business. Uh, he did reinstitute people to people after that was eliminated by Trump. Um, so again, that's one. We actually were traveling under support to Cuban people, which really it's kind of identical to people to people. And it's like, I don't even like talking about people to people just because it's the one that the Democrats and Republicans uh, tend to, you know, pick on and, and then they really shouldn't. Right. So anyway, those are some of the exceptions to go. Uh, that's a little bit about how the presidents have handled it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Cuba today, which is pretty important. And at the beginning of the talk, when we were all coming on, people were asking me about, you know, how things have changed. And, you know, the more uh, Cuba changes, the more it stays the same. So as things unravel, right now what's going on, though, unfortunately, um, is we're going through one of these peak periods of suppression where last summer about this time, some of the Cubans uh, got involved with uh, kind of like an insurrection against the government and the government came down pretty hard. So a lot of people were thrown in jail. Some of the jail terms were extremely uh, large, like five to 20 year sentences in jail. Uh, some people got beat up. Um, it was an ugly thing. And since that's occurred, a lot of people now have been leaving Cuba because they don't think that there's going to be any changes. And uh, in in some cases, people are desperate to sell her house to buy a airline ticket to get to Nicaragua because you don't really need, I think, a passport or a visa into Nicaragua. And then they're waking their way to Mexico and then ultimately in the United States. So I know personally in the last six months, people have left Cuba. And I think uh, in the month of April, there was over 30,000. So it's kind of, it's un unfortunate because you got to figure if we're suffering with COVID, you know, being the United States, uh, just countries around the world are really suffering. And, um, you know, even with the whole situation with Russia now and the grain and Sri Lanka and food, uh, there's large food lines in, uh, in, in Cuba, unfortunately, and uh, tourism has really kind of stopped until November of this year, which that's true of a lot of countries. I mean, even European countries, People were remiss to go to Germany or France or England, um, but uh, Cuba opened back up in November and they have their own vaccine. So they're pretty proud. And, and their series of shots for the vaccine is four. I mean, they don't talk anything about, okay, we're gonna have the shots and then we're gonna have a booster. No, it's just four shots, period. And they've been pretty effective with their uh, shots. And for me coming back, um, Going back to Cuba in April and starting up, probably the biggest concern I have was just the whole COVID issue because at that time, the law was to enter Cuba, you needed to be a PCR test negative and to leave Cuba and to get into the United States, you had to be PCR test negative. And we had uh, 25 people and uh, I was nervous as hell, but everybody tested negative going in. Um, and then coming out as well. And then just recently, all those laws changed that Cuba said, no, you don't no longer have to take a PCR test, just bring in your vaccination card, which were never checked anywhere along the line. Uh, and then I think the United States changed that rule two weeks before our last trip in June, so that you didn't have to have uh, the COVID test, you know, coming uh, back in the United States. And again, now, even in the States, we're having an, an increase in numbers of COVID everywhere. They're talking about now with schools going back in session in August, they may be wearing masks again. So COVID has played a huge impact on Cuba. They're uh, in, in the process right now, they're building a lot of hotels in Cuba. Uh, I don't know about the wisdom of that. We actually did family stays and um, I think that went over really well. Families are very friendly. Um, they're very service oriented. It's kind of like staying in a um, more of a hostel where they're there, they take care of you, but they're not necessarily like 
you're studying Spanish immersion and you have that kind of link with the family. So it's a professional uh, setting and they do a really nice job. Uh, they, they do a, a breakfast is included. And then when we're uh, cruising around Havana, all of the lunches are included just because food does become an issue. And you need to know that we can stop, uh, you know, one place in a restaurant uh, and have food uh, and that works. Now, another very current issue that's going on right now is money because up until two years ago, there was the US, I mean, there was a Cuban peso and then there was a, a, a monetary form called the Cook or the CUC. And the Cook was kind of this invention of Fidel. He basically said, hey, we're gonna come up with this thing and call it a CUC and it's gonna have the value of a Euro and that's gonna be kind of a currency that we make money on. It had no value outside of Cuba, but it was a good thing kind of for Cuba. And he, it worked you know, for the people coming in, they use those monies. And what he would do is say, okay, if something costs 10 cooks, which was basically $10 or 10 euros, then they would charge 10 Cuban pesos to the, to the Cubans. And that was like $1 was 24 Cuban pesos. So it kind of worked. It's like, okay, we're not going to charge our Cubans who make $50 a month, the same thing as we're going to charge a foreigner. Um, but they ended that two years ago. And what's been happening in the last uh, eight months is just the, against the dollar, the Cuban peso has just taken a, a tumble. So the Cuban peso now on the black market is worth a hundred uh, 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 Cuban pesos. So you can see where if I am a person entering Cuba and I go to the bank in Cuba, or I go to a hotel and exchange my money, my $1 is worth 25 Cuban pesos. Well, why would I, you know, do that when the family I'm staying with is offering me 90 pesos a dollar, right? So our money is worth almost four times what it is on the black market. Hence, you take that money and you have to use Cuban pesos to buy things. Some, some people will take dollars, some people will take uh, euros, but for the most part, you're operating in this, in this money that's play money. And now our dollars worth four times what it was worth six months ago. So we, our families <laughs> offered to make that exchange. And I'm kind of like, how can I tell my people to go to, you know, a hotel or to a bank and get 25% worth their money instead of getting four times that. And so that gives us more purchasing power um, in Cuba. But unfortunately for the Cubans, they're just taking a big hit. So not only is there a shortage of food, but now their dollar, their dollar is worth 25 cents. I mean, you can kind of analogize it that way. So that's why if you've heard or haven't heard, or there's a lot of shows now about people just leaving in droves, sell, literally selling their houses to buy an airline ticket, which is sad, right? And I just saw today um, here in Sweden, that's a special about it, about this guy who's going to Argentina and he's a shoemaker, he's 76 years old, but he's like, hey, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's tough living here and I've always wanted to go. So he's taken off. Um, anyway, those are, those are some of the issues, the current issues right now, the remittances, the money issue, uh, the, the legal travel to Cuba. Um, what's gonna happen with all that uh, with the next election could change again. Usually these rules don't start taking effect until two years into a president's term just because Cuba is not the top priority of any president. But uh, the peak uh, freedom time for the movement for Americans was under Obama. And then I think the most restricted time was uh, prior to him, which was uh, baby, um, you know, baby Bush. And, and Trump kind of shattered with that too, eliminating it. And calling Cuba a terrorist nation, which is just simply not true, uh, kind of kills the university market. And, and a lot of people, if they read and say, oh, well, our president says it's, it's a terrorist nation, then so be it, and just cancel their plans to go to Cuba. So I've, I've been on this roller coaster of watching Cuba. Um, I guess for me, what keeps me going back is I have my entourage and my peeps that I, I want to keep them happy. I want to keep them uh, moving and, and doing well. And it's my kind of extended family. Um, I'm frustrated with the policies towards money, uh, the way that they've taken it in the shorts with this devaluation, um, and it's made it harder for them to live. And, you know, the result last year of the uprising, a lot of people were jailed with long sentences and 
uh, there's a big repression going on. So uh, it's a tricky balance, but my philosophy for the last 27 years of doing this is um, I want to try to create a window, create a window uh, so people can kind of see Cuba for itself. And, and maybe I distort it a little bit just because I want to be positive and I want to support the NGOs that are doing good things uh, for families, whether it's like Jorge was saying, Arte Corte, where my friend there basically started, um, he started a school for people that could become barbers. And later on that expanded to bartending schools. And they also blend that in with art. Uh, they had one project in particular that they worked on for parents that had special needs children and they couldn't leave their house. So we were bringing supplies of fingernail polish and cuticle boards so that these parents could do, these mothers could do like a nail boutique in their house. Um, then another project is Moralianda where they're painting murals and I brought Junie Schultz there um, with Sonoma State and she later asked me to bring her cartoons down. So we painted uh, Snoopy in the walls of Muraliando, and that's a big, huge art project that supports that community with murals internationally. Um, there's other uh, projects around art. There's other projects around uh, guitars. There's an orchestra of guitars of kids. There's 50 kids that play and an orchestra of guitars, which is pretty amazing to watch. Um, and there's just this indomitable spirit of the Cubans. It's like, no matter how far you push them down, it's like they just get back up, you know, and I, I admire and respect that. So um, I guess me being kind of an independent kind of guy and seeing, being autonomous, I respect that that's what Cuba tries to do. And they do have a, a good medical system that's free. They do have a good education, that educational system that's free in the neighborhoods uh, where the people live their doctor lives, their, their GP or general practitioner lives in the neighborhood. So you just walk down the street and you see your GP, uh, he lives upstairs and downstairs is his clinic. And so Cuba has spent a lot of money on their educational system and their education for medical students and medicine. A lot of countries from other, other people from other Latin countries in Africa come there and study. And they also send doctors abroad. So that's kind of an overview. And, and now I'm ready to take any questions or some of you may have some questions and I, I think there might be a few people out there that have come have been on the recent trip so if you have anything you want to add or or ask questions about um you know please do that okay i see a hand raised let me see if i can as uh, susan yes hello hi Thank susan you for your presentation oh, you're i welcome. Like know what nonprofits you can particularly recommend so in terms of like uh, if you were to go there or what do you mean both both i mean the ones that i worked with muraliando arte corte la guitarra those are three of the solid ones that, that i've kind of worked with they're hard to get to unless you're there you know but yeah. these are people that i have direct contact with and when i'm there and visiting them i know the money is going in the right place i see brian with a hand up uh yes can you hear me i can okay um I'm from the French Forest of Long Island. Uh, they recommended this presentation. Just wanted to give a shout out. Um, Hello, met, Long Island. <laughs> I think I'm the only one from the group on here, but needless to say, um, I'd like to visit Cuba. Uh, a friend of mine has gone many times. He says you can go online, buy a ticket to Havana. You get in, they ask you a few questions. Not a big deal. I've spoken to people that say there are those 12 categories that you have to fit into, but that's not even such a big deal. You could go to say it's for medicinal or health reasons and go into a pharmacy and buy aspirin with a receipt. Um, I know people in Cuba from Facebook. I've sent money to people with Cuba Max, seems to be the only way you can send money is this Cuba Max. Um, I know professional people I met on Facebook. My question is, is it that simple to get there, to meet these people, to go online and buy a ticket to Havana round trip for 10 days or two or three weeks without much hassle or work? So that's a really good question. And, and you know, um, yeah. I don't want to blow smoke up the wazoo, but the reality is uh, I've done this long enough that, that I've seen the changes, the tide change, and I never would have thought that it would have gone back as far as it did with Trump. Um, and I've seen that under Bush, they find people and they actually set up a tribunal 
and set them up. Now, does that happen to everybody? Is that going to happen to you? That's a risk you would take, right? So at the worst case scenario, you get a four or $5,000 fine and you'd be going in circles in Cuba because you couldn't really find what you're trying to look for. Um, that right now is more difficult than it's ever been uh, since probably the very first trip that Jorge and I took in 1999 marked the period ended called the special period. So between 1992 and 1998, uh, Russia was crumbling with the USSR. The whole Cold War was kind of won by us, I guess you could say. And they quit giving money to Cuba and Cuba really suffered from 1992 to 1998. There were, there were studies done on the average Cuban, how much weight they lost. They were eating rats. Uh, they lost 70% of their energy in one year, right? So you can imagine what we're dealing with right now with gas prices going up to $6. They lost 70% of their energy. So that was a horrible time. And, and now it's, I've seen both. It's, it's as bad, if not worse, because of the food, food shortages are similar. So if you had asked me that question 10 years ago or five years ago under Obama, I would have said, maybe if we were drinking a beer, because I would never say, yeah, go illegally to Cuba. I just can't do that. I mean, that's just, I can't say, go in, sign the affidavit, get lucky. It's just, I can't do that. So from my position, I could never do that. However, if I was with my best buddy and we'd had four or five scotches, I just said, yeah, you know, you could do this. I wouldn't try that now. It's Why just, not? there's... There's just two, it's too uncertain. And I hired uh, two additional guides uh, on my first trip just to make sure that, that we had enough food in case something happened or if someone got sick or just having that movement. Now I took a smaller group uh, just in June and that was kind of a different story because we used different transportation. Everything was just smaller uh, and easier. And I just kind of navigated all that with the bigger group. Um, but even then I, I just, I don't feel real comfortable with the the food situation and the government is really watching everything. They're suppressing their people. They're not going to throw us in jail, but they're watching every move we make. And and that's go, always You can't go under those 12 specific categories. You can, but what I'm saying is navigating in Cuba when you get there is very complicated and I wouldn't recommend it, honestly. That's me. Yeah. Navigating in terms of Trying to find own, food, or? trying to find places to stay and all that. So, all right. yeah. George, you got your hand up? Yeah, Paul and Jorge, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, as most of you know, one of the reasons uh, Paul is presenting to us today is because I uh, asked us to have him give this presentation. It is my goal to get Friendship for Sacramento to lead a trip to, uh, to Cuba with, with Paul's uh, guidance. And I, I want to get Friendship Force International, uh, Jeremy, to, to endorse that and support that. And, and I'm kind of interested, uh, Paul, in uh, what dates you have tentatively in, in April. And, and just to underline the fact that Friendship Force endorses and supports, and that's all we do, is do family stays. So we yeah. stay with people in other countries. And uh, for the whole week of our visit, I don't know if that's what you're what you've done, but that yeah. that fits into the friendship force concept. So yeah, uh, so right now, I mean, the dates that I'm looking at, I've got, um, and I'm literally when I get home, uh, I get home on Wednesday, and I'll be working on my schedule for the next ten days. Um, but tentatively, I'm looking at the first week in December and the first week in April as trip dates right now. And those aren't, I don't have like the exact day it starts and ends, but George, as soon as I get that, that's, uh, I'll be able to give that to you. And I have several people that come kind of want to go in those time frames, And so that's why I would probably prefer to do it later in December and, and roll it into Christmas or New Year's, but it just gets real expensive with the airfare. It adds, you know, uh, can add another $1,500 to a trip. And I, I don't so want to pass it. Would, would have set friendship for Sacramento lead it and then fill in, from other clubs who, who yeah. were interested. So, uh, and uh, oh, I, I, noticed, I noticed that one of our visitors on this is from, uh, is from uh, the island of uh, Vancouver. Hi, Tim. Hi, I heard somebody's voice out there. I'm not sure who it was, but. Uh, yes, go ahead. I, I think it was well, there's me. Somebody. I'm Brenda. I just took the trip in June with Paul. 
And I want to tell you, it was so smooth, so easy, so reasonable. And there's really, I wouldn't encourage you to try to do it by yourself because um, for all the reasons he said, and just getting around and, and managing to find what you really want to go see, whereas Paul and his Cuban guys will get you in your in the formal time what he wants you to see and what we'd like to see. And then they got us everywhere on our free time. So it's a great trip. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Hi, Brennan. No, they, and, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because I've done this trip for uh, – 27 years and and Brenda and her daughter they're just there's some people are just like man these are just good people and I could do this all day with them and then other people are like oh my god you know this, this person is so complicated but <laughs> I, I really appreciated them on the trip and I mean I can give you just one example okay we were going to go to a Cuban cigar factory and we had everything all laid out to go and at the last minute um they told my guy they said you have to have cuc uh, you have to have um euros okay so i ran to one of the families and i don't know if you guys know the dollar and the euro is almost equal now right so uh, we may even have jumped them a little bit so i went to my friend's house and and she's basically the bank <laughs> so she's got euros and dollars and cuban pesos and i even took pictures of her and some of our students you know uh you know making money exchanges and she's like, I'm going to give you one to one. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty good, right? So I take my pile of dollars, hand them to her. She hands me a pile of euros. I hand them to Osmel. Osmel runs to the Cuban cigar factory. And they say, no, 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 no. You need to take that money and go to a Cuban bank and get a Cuban credit card and put the euros on. I mean, this is the kind of crap that it's like, what? You know, and some of the places we go to, you, you literally couldn't buy because they're like, no, no, we don't take we don't take dollars, we don't take euros, we only take this Cuban card that Cubans could get. And they made, made it very complicated for us. So we would try to find things around that. And literally, the last couple of months, this just been the way it is. I mean, the sad truth, and I'm just going to be straight up honest with you, very transparent, is if I'm a Cuban, and I can get a hold of a dollar and turn it into, turn 25 pesos magically into 100 pesos, guess what I'm going to be doing all day long, right? And that's what they're doing. And so people are hoarding dollars. They've created this huge black market. The euro is falling against the dollar anyway. Uh, and it's a shit show. And so as long as my people can get their, their dollars or euros turned into 100 Cuban pesos, I don't care because I'm not, I'm not going to try to play that money game. I mean, I'm not going to get busted by the government uh, trying to, you know. And I've got friends that are Cubans that work between – Cuba and Australia, and they're telling me about how they got all these dollars. I would not want to be a Cuban with all those dollars in my house. I mean, <laughs> that's not going to be that hard to figure out who you are. So it's just for us as tourists, it doesn't affect us at all. Um, but as, as, you know, America, as Cubans living there trying to get this money and then trying to go to the street and trying to buy pork or chicken with it, man, it's hard. Um, but thank you, Brenda, for your comments. I appreciate it. I see a hand by Shirley. Well, I think Dan and Angie were next. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Dan and Angie. Hi, Paul. Yeah, Hi. great, great presentation. I appreciate it. Thank uh, you. you. You were talking about politics strictly in terms of Democrats and Republicans in this country. What about the Cuban American diaspora? in this country? How much influence do they have on I like that the word, uh, situation? Diaspora. I wrote it down. Can I'm going to have to look it up. You gave me a new vocabulary. Word. A new vocabulary. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm assuming you're talking about there. Can you guys hear me okay? Somebody's got... Yeah. Somebody's got... Oh. Oh. It's, it's a... Uh, it's, it's a... Uh, did you, did you hear what I just said? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. mute Dan. Okay. Okay. Maybe that so, yeah, I heard the question and I, I could spend 10 hours on this topic, but the reality is the Cuban Americans in Miami run the politics of the U S between Cuba. That's just the reality. Right. So, um, you know, and those, those old sayings that give me you're tired, you're weak, you're poor. That was not the case of the Cubans coming to the U S in 1960, 61, 62. These are the wealthy people coming in. 
they pretty much control Florida. They control Miami. And um, there's over 2 million of them. And uh, until uh, it was 2017, I think, or 16, that Obama changed the wet foot, dry foot policy, which meant if you were a Cuban and you touched foot on soil in Florida or in the U.S., within a year, as long as you weren't, you know, running around doing a bunch of illegal activities, you became a citizen, not not a resident, not a green card, a citizen. So I know a lot of Cubans who, unlike Mexicans, are still waiting 20 years later for citizenship, you know. Um, but because of that, the, the Floridian Cubans have paved this road and, and just made it work really well. And um, they're still, I kept thinking of myself, I said, okay, well, they're now 90 and their kids are like 60 or 65 or 70. And they're still this force of, you know, I think eventually that's going to disappear, but I thought I would have thought by now it would be gone, but it's not. So, you know, are the grandkids going to have that same feeling? I know that I took a group with uh, Sonoma State University. The president was Cuban American. And his mother forbade him to go to Cuba. So here he is, 65 years old. He's a president of the university. He would give the class on uh, the Cuban reality. And he's like, all right, okay, Paul, take him to Cuba because I can't, mommy won't let me go. And he, you know, he wouldn't go. Uh, that's even him being 65 to 70. You know, the mom's like, no, you will not go to Cuba. They took our house. You know? <laughs> so that, that's the mentality that still controls the politics to this day is and and they can travel freely cubans born in cuba tied within you know recent ancestry they can go to cuba freely so it's them again for themselves saying well if we want to go it's okay or we can go see mom or dad or uncle or cousin and and that's okay okay uh tim and shirley thank you tim and shirley, yeah. So in the video, I saw it seemed that most of the people weren't wearing masks. Um, very few people wearing masks. What what is the COVID situation? What is the rate of COVID right now in the country? And what are the rules regarding wearing masks, et cetera? So that's a good question. Um, it, they, that just changed. And I think uh, within Brenda, was that true? Like while we were there or like a couple days before? you no longer had to wear a mask in Cuba, okay? Um, the, that's the reality as of today. The rules keep changing all the time, but they're, they don't fear because 92% of their population, that figure I can give you, is vaccinated. Um, I don't know their rates of, of, of infection of people getting COVID in Cuba, but I know that they're not worried about their population getting it and the people that I've been in contact that live in Cuba and have had been vaccinated by them, they feel very comfortable with it. Um, it's the U.S. has basically said you don't need a mask even coming back into the U.S. You don't have to wear a mask on a plane. I just took a flight, Lufthansa, and they made it mandatory. They said you have to wear a mask on our flight, and I guess airlines can do that. So I had to wear a mask uh, flying, and, and I'm happy to wear a mask. I don't have a problem with that because internationally you just don't know so that does that answer your question i mean i think i tried to cover as many pieces of the covid puzzle and even in our country it's changing you know every month thank you mm -hmm. if i could just uh i just looked it up cuba's um covid rate is 7.7 .7, whereas the u.s right now is 535 so they're just a fraction of what ours is. When you say 7.7, .7, do you mean percentage wise? 100,000. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. For, for yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Their Our shots, yeah. They're, you know, we have like two shots and two boosters. Their series is four shots, period. It's like you finish their shots when you finish your fourth shot. And, and, they're, and they basically say, you're going to get it and you do it. And that's just that. They don't have a choice. So that's why their rates are high. And that's why their percentages of people getting it are high and their percentages of people that are getting COVID are low. Yeah. Um, if I could just make a comment, I was in Cuba four years ago and one on one, I was in a, it was on a tour, you know, or all with guides and everything. And somebody wanted to go to the beach and our guide said, I, sorry, I can't take you. It's not on your itinerary. So, I mean, that was really, um, 
Yeah, I, so let me, yeah, let me tell you, there's two pieces to that, okay? Just like you can imagine, <laughs> like the old good and the bad and the ugly movie. There are two types of people in the world, those that come through the door and those that come through the window. Uh, but in this case, you got two sets of people creating rules, right? So you got, let's say, legally, legally, you're supposed to have an American tour operator there with you, but that doesn't happen. I'm one of the only people that shows up. Usually they just hire a Cuban and the Cubans do everything. So you've got two people that can hijack your trip, me and or the Cuban, okay? Typically, it's the Cuban hijacking the trip, and that's why a lot of universities and people just say, I'm not going because this guy's a tyrant and he's telling us what we're going to do. And, and me, I try not to be a tyrant, but I know that there are things we can do and things we can't. Now, in the old days, okay, this was 15 years ago, they used to say things like, you cannot go to Cuba and you cannot go to the beach and you cannot drink mojitos and you cannot uh, smoke cigars. And that's kind of all bullshit to a way because there's not going to be someone on, from the CIA on every one of my buses, period. And, and I had a big problem with the Cubans hijacking my trip because I say, hey, look, I'm with Professor Santana and this is what he wants to do. And they're like, no, 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 we can't do this and that. And, and I found out pretty quickly how to defeat that is this, you know, I took out my nice, big, thick American wallet. I said, why are you a tour guide? You know, why do you do this? Is it because you love it? <laughs> you know? And ultimately, they said, hey, you know, we make more money. It's like, so do you want to make good tips or bad tips? <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, that's just, that's just something I learned. And it's like, if you want to make good tips, we're a team. And if you don't, then we're not a team. And guess what? I won't use you again. So my guides want to work with me. And they know that I'm fair with them and they're fair with me. And it's like... I tell them what's fair and I know on average what people make or should make. And I suggest that to the people and the people are more than willing and happy to do that because these guys are working their asses off every day and doing a great job. And so what we do is more or less nine, you know, the government, when they used to actually write rules you could read, would say from nine to five, you're supposed to keep them busy. And so for the most part, I do that. However, there might be a day, a Tuesday or a Friday, where we finish at three. And so I'll say, look, at the end of the day, I know you guys want to go shopping. Okay. I mean, I get it. So we're going to finish a little early today. So at three o'clock, we're going to go to uh, check out uh, the Tiangas where you can go shopping. And we're going to just leave you there because legally we can't park the bus in front of that area. And you guys can take a taxi back. And if I'm getting a group that comes in um, and they're not necessarily the group I want, but they're like, dude, we want to go to the beach. Then, then we're going to go to the beach and we'll pick a day where um, we, we finish early and we're not going to, you know, even me, I don't want to be sitting on the beach in the sun for three hours I and, mean, you know, kind of losing my hair anyway. Right. So I, I might want to go out for an hour or something. And even then people are like, well, no, I, I, I'd rather sit in the shade. So I'm looking for a place where we can sit people down in the shade and maybe they can even get a soda or a mojito or something like that. And the other people can go splash around in the water. I mean, I love being in the water more than anything. So I don't have a problem with that. So uh, I know that's a long-winded answer. <laughs> and, and the old rule was you can't go to the beach because this isn't fun. But the new reality is, you know, be reasonable. And, and yeah, if we're out 9 to 3, let's go to the beach for a couple of hours. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Anyone else have any questions? Oh, uh, bringing in gifts, uh, you know, bringing in supplies. Do, yeah. do the, do the, uh, are there customs duties? Do you have to worry about customs agents confiscating things? Or That's a really good question. And Jorge can address this as well. This is the first year that I've used JetBlue or I've used uh, Southwest Airlines. And you guys know what their luggage policies are, right? Two big ass loot luggages and a, and a carry on. So you can bring a lot of stuff where normally in my writings, I would say, okay, everybody just brings one small carry on and pack on what you can. Um, and we had, uh, and Brenda and, and Tiffany can probably answer this as well as any, because they brought a shitload of stuff up. I don't think anybody in our groups, these last two groups were checked because sometimes you have to worry, like if you're bringing a hundred sets of guitar strings or 75 pairs of sunglasses or a lot of toothpaste that could get taken away from you because customs thinks you're trying to make a business in Cuba. But um, do you guys have any comment on that, Tiffany or Brenda? 
Well, Paul, I don't know if, if the question was directed for those that go to Cuba and then come back to the United States with cigars or rum, which are uh, the former of uh, you want to bring things to Cuba. Is that a is there a hassle with that? Probably we not. didn't have anybody, Jorge, did we, that got hung up? No, no, not at all. And I, that didn't happen with the second. And I kind of worried about that just because <sighs> I knew they were, you could bring in literally two 50 pound bags. And most people for a one week trip are not going to be bringing that much clothes. And I know I personally brought in a lot of stuff too, but none of us had any issues getting it in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When I went, uh, the only people that were hassling were the Cubans coming back with huge yeah. things of stuff. Uh, and yeah, I, they didn't have to wait a really long time for a luggage. They would, they would plastic wrap, you know, huge TVs and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> that. That would get, I mean, obviously you can see the, the, the Sony on the outside of the blue <laughs> plastic. So, hey, yeah. Paul, I think Tim Trainer has a question. Yes, sir, Tim. You got to un unmute yourself, Tim. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, thanks for your presentation. Very good. I ha uh, just wanted to have, make a comment. I'm, I'm Canadians, of course, Canadians operate under different. Uh, standards vis-a-vis -vis Cuba, but uh, the one thing that uh, would, seems to me would, would be very relevant if uh, Friendship Force, is, if Sacramento is uh, trying, is, is, is proposing to have a Friendship Force exchange in, uh, or journey, I should say, in, uh, with Cuba, would be uh, tying in with their uh, uh, Spanish language learning setup, because uh, that's one thing where I have, I'm a student of Spanish, and Many people that I studied with have gone down to Cuba uh, specifically for that reason, because they found it was very uh, conducive uh, because you're, you're in, within a family and they apparently have quite a good setup for that. So I don't know if you had any comment on that or not. I've, I've taken groups. I've actually, Kaiser Permanente, I've taken medical Spanish groups down, Sutter, Dignity, mostly met around the medical arena. The right. students... Uh, the, your normal student, I lived in Cornavaca, Mexico for five years, which is like a Mecca for a foreign language. And I've worked in Salamanca, Spain, but um, those are more set up just because of the cost uh, to go and do a long-term program. Even a week though, it wouldn't be that hard. I know Professor Santana has written a book on Spanish for the professions and uh, it would be more like survival Spanish because in a week you're not gonna get that much done. And sure. there's just so much to see that you're probably not going to want to spend more than an hour a day studying Spanish. Um, but we've done it. I've done that before. I mean, I used to just do that in Mexico and just right. do that in Guatemala. So, right. Just something that's not hard to add. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, Paul, I just want to mention uh, to the people listening to this program or part of the Zoom conference that uh, on August the 5th, I think you're gonna be joining us at uh, Woodland, those of you that live near Sacramento. And uh, I'm sure you would be available to answer any questions, right? Or if people wanna continue with uh, a dialogue with you and whatever plans you have for the future trips to Cuba, so. Yeah, and um, you're gonna have some nice art there. And um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's gonna be a nice event. Yeah, it's going to be more information about the event, please. Yeah, it's going to be three for three uh, photographers and one painter, and one of the most uh, probably well-known photographers is Roberto Salas, S A L A S. His father and Roberto went uh, to Cuba, invited by Fidel Castro before the revolution. And uh, Roberto Salas was born in Brooklyn. And if you talk with him, his English sounds exactly from Brooklyn. So uh, Roberto Salas has done quite a, a lot of photography for Cuba or on Cuba. He was a war correspondent for, of course, uh, Cuba in B and has a lot of uh, uh, followers. So he's gonna be one of the main photographers. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think he'll be able to join us, but we will have someone that's a very close friend of his speaking to him about him. So well, when and, and where, Jorge? It's going to be in, uh, in Woodland, California, at the county office there in uh, Woodland. And uh, to give you the address, uh, it's 625 uh, 
it's called Gallery 625, and it's uh, the County Administration Building on 625 Court Street in Woodland. And it starts at 5.30. We're going to have music, some appetizers, uh, and uh, a chance for you to see some of these works. So yeah. it's the invitation extended, and um, hopefully, Paul, you'll be joining us, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and to follow up on that, uh, what's the date? Jorge, Jorge sent out the information to me. I will put it on the website when I can. It'll be on the community events section of the upcoming events on our Friendship for Sacramento website. But right. not everybody has access. That's on here. No, access no, to that's it. right. Okay, so it's August fifth. Okay, great. And, you, and I can give you to my my cell number as well is is 916-225-8207 so you guys feel free to give me a call if you want to as well just to ask me any question on that yeah and the event starts at 5 30 from 5 30 to 8 p.m so hopefully some of you can make it that live in this northern california area thank you very much i'm gonna have to take off i have a commitment coming up so okay uh, Great. Thank you very much, Ray, for having me there. And hope to see you yeah, soon. Yeah, and Ray, I'll talk to you later on, too. I'll try to get some more information out as these dates oh, come more available. Maybe okay. I, okay, good. I, I, I thought well, since everybody's on right now and we're talking about it, uh, you can share your reactions. And it might be interesting to take uh, just a quick poll of everybody. Uh, you were mentioning the April 2023 as a tentative date. Uh, how many people are seriously inter interested in that? Uh, if you could go to the reactions button and put a thumbs up or something, or, or send a comment, maybe. Oh, I've got one, two, three. I got um, one, two, three. three people have their hands up. And there were six people that had um, thumbs up. So, yeah, I'll be I'll be working on some information, Ray, and get that out. Get that okay. out. Okay, be talking to you about that, and even getting some ideas for some of the itinerary as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Excellent.